Energy is deregulated. Electricity is deregulated. Natural gas is deregulated in many states across the U.S., from Maine to D.C., Illinois, Texas, and um, California, parts of it. Um, And so what do I mean when I say that we bring transparency or that there's been even an opaque market there? Well, these markets have been um, deregulated since 1997, 1998. And unlike other deregulated markets, there's been no information resource available to purchasers, to consumers of electricity or natural gas for that matter. So there's no, you can't open the Wall Street Journal if you are a large building owner in New York City and say, what should I be buying for, what should I be paying for electricity today? So a lot of those consumers that I describe are like this poor guy scratching his head. There are layers upon layers of information, and there's no resource that makes it makes data actionable for that consumer, whether it's a residential customer or a large user, a business user. So what are, what's the impact of that? And actually, this will probably be familiar to some of you. Um, they get... So they, people play around with data and they work through spreadsheets. The, the markets don't work very efficiently. The result is that really consumers pay more than they should. Have, have any of you looked at your utility bill? Raise your hand if you have. <coughs> and does it make a lot of sense intuitively? Can you make mm-hmm. sense of it? No. And this is the information age that we're living in. And yet there is a real dearth of actionable information in these markets across the board. So the result is that these markets don't function very well. People pay more or they have a very difficult time managing risk. This is a very relevant discussion to what we've been talking about all day today. They don't know if they've made a good decision, if they've purchased from another supplier in the past. They don't know if they've saved money. They don't know how their decisions will look over the coming months. There's been no forward-looking view that says, watch out for price spikes (laughs) in, in the Northeast for January, February, and March, which we experienced this year. What we're trying to do is really transform this data into information that consumers can then act on. And we're having a lot of success there. We're making data, energy that used to be just plain data, much more accessible. And then we're able then to better align the customer the customer requirements, the customer's business goals with their decisions, and then we're enabling them to make better decisions year over year. And the result is that, that businesses are spending less time, um, less time managing data. They're able to use that time more effectively to make decisions instead of managing spreadsheets. They're ultimately able to better manage risk and align their business interest with their decision-making capability. And ultimately, the goal is for them to save money. And we're able to save customers between 7 and 15% on their costs year over year. What is the big picture impact of this? This is one small piece of the discussion that we've been having here. But the big picture is that businesses alone spend 400 to 600 billion dollars on electricity in deregulated markets. Freeing up some of that inefficiency in the form of savings means that those businesses can then better evaluate other opportunities for investment, whether it's cogen projects or energy efficiency programs or renewable programs. So that is our objective. Our ultimate objective is to help these markets work more efficiently by just taking this first piece and making it work better. We just, uh, just thinking about transparency, we just went through a process in California, which we were involved in. Um, we passed a proposition to close a corporate tax loophole and put uh, the money into energy efficiency in schools. And my organization was very focused on making part of the deal if a school was to get money for efficiency, they had to give the state their, all their utility data because California has no tracking system for any of that. They don't even have an inventory of school buildings right now. And um, the, it's an interesting story because we actually succeeded, so that's a good story. But it's interesting, the opposition we got to that 
was not from the utilities, but from the, um, the teachers unions and the schools, because they were so worried that it would be yet another list where they would be shown to be failing. Getting an F. Right, getting an F, that they didn't want to have another thing where they had to give their information to the state. It was really, really interesting sort of moment. Um, we did end up getting it, and now the question will be uh, what, what happens with it, and right. it's a huge other challenge, because state budgets are such that there's no one who's paid to do things like deal with that amount of energy right. data and actually turn it into something meaningful, right? <laughs> right? Exactly. Uh, but it was a great, uh, a very interesting experience to go through and really underscored the need for these tools that, like you're talking about, that allow this to be just easier and more yeah. cross platform and just right. easier to understand. Right. I mean, when we talk about what we do, a lot of people say, I can't believe that's not available. Mm -hmm. That just seems so basic. But, you know, the util utilities have not been in the in the in the information business, okay. you know, and now um, only in the last probably five to six years have the tools been accessible enough and low cost enough to make it easier to 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 you know do the things that yeah. you just described. Can I just sort of tweak tweak this transparency thing because it's it's sort of hard hard to argue against transparency, so I thought I would give it a shot. Um. <laughs> well, there are a lot of people who would argue against it. I mean, there are entrenched interests that really don't want, I mean, I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist here, but you know, there are plenty of people, these, these industries have worked very well without right. consumers having good information. Yeah. Right, but just to, just to sort of follow the, the, the thinking, because maybe during the course of the day, there is still within the conference maybe a kind of an division that hasn't been sort of highlighted between, let's say, the transparency argument, which would be if we had access to the data and we could visualize it in a way that you could make actions and then we could be more equitable and, and so on and so on. But in the, end, in, in the end, using an economic paradigm, in other words, the consumer, well-informed consumer makes well-informed decisions um, versus, let's say, the cultural dimension of the discourse, which would say, not necessarily that as long as it's within an economic paradigm, um, efficient, more efficient decisions can be made. So in a certain sense, the consumer can make more profit. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of uh, movement of profit. Hmm. But for example, transparency would, from a cultural point of view, include knowing who died in order for you to put the oil in your car, right? right? So a different kind of transparency, a transparency to social impact, mm. to trauma, to, yeah. you know, like, so, so it seems to me that, that m maybe in what's otherwise a beautiful now, how much Happy Families event, there is a, sort of a division between a kind of a more, what would normally in the past have been thought of as a more sort of scientific approach, data-centric data approach to a more cultural approach. And I guess the the pleasure of, of working together on this day is to see how those two things can be linked together. It's, it's a great, I was, when I was listening to the earlier panel, which I agree was really well done, um, and I really want to see that movie, but when I was listening to that <laughs> earlier great. panel, I was thinking a lot about this because there is a real question, there are a lot of people who argue this, that, it, that more transparency doesn't always lead to better decision making. I mean, right. and I was thinking a lot about the diamond industry when I was watching that. Because of course we all now know about all of the uh, horrible things in the diamond industry and it hasn't actually stopped most people from right. thinking that the diamond is a necessary part of their lives as an engagement ring or whatever. It hasn't, hasn't actually changed that. It's changed it to some sustainable production, but the diamond as a symbol of status is still very strong. It's right. very much still part right. of our culture. Right. Right. Uh, and so to what extent, and, and you know, the, in a lot of places, the big car that uses a lot of oil is a status symbol because you know that gas is getting more expensive and it's a symbol that you can afford the more expensive gas to put in that car. So it's an interesting question how right. this stuff does work culturally and whether you sort of, you know, turn it, it can be turned on its head. Yeah, and, and, and so for example, I think smart cities is not a smart idea. Um, or smart cities, to say it another way around, smart cities is the idea of a particular set of corporations mm. who sell information and work with information services. So in a, in a way, the IBMs and Siemens of the world have become the kind of traffic engineers of our, of, of our age. So they will use the discourse of transparency, metrics, access to data, ability to make decisions, whether personal or corporate or 
community-based, but ultimately it's no less uh, a form of exploitation, let's say, than, than any other. So this is where the, where the figure of the artist may, might be interesting because, of course, the discourse of transparency, let's say, in a more scientific paradigm implies there is, as it were, a truth Right. that one needs to, as it were, remove as many veils as possible to see. But right. there is a right. truth there. But, but from the more cultural paradigm, speaking in kind of cliches, the truth is produced, is constructed, and there are many possible truths and many possible um, things that you could be shown. Right. And, and so I, I think it, it's very interesting to think how, how can these two different narratives be in a way that can be harnessed together i do think one without the other doesn't it's work it's not full yeah, yeah it's not yeah. the complete picture i also think um and i've forgotten who made this point earlier but you need to be very careful about your benchmark and your reference point and how you're defining how we we talk about this a lot internally in our business what is the baseline or what is, you know, how is the data developed, produced, and, and, um, and provided to customers because, um, you know, you can make data talk in a lot of different ways. And right. so just saying that it's transparent carries, I think, a lot of additional responsibility mm -hmm. about keeping, you know, an arm's length and being very clear about, about how the... Um, quantitative analysis is completed. Well, right. Jeremy, you should, uh, I mean, you know, Jeremy was talking earlier about this because uh, the Carbon Disclosure Project, their whole theory is if people disclose their carbon, their current carbon assets, then they will be able to see where there may, they, those assets may be stranded and Exxon just disclosed theirs and then decided that it was fine. So right. that was an interesting exactly. example yeah. of sort of transparency that didn't lead to any kind of change. what it was supposed to lead to. <laughs> well, see, from my perspective, Jeremy's an artist. There's no question about it. <laughs> so constructing the image of a carbon bubble, a bubble is an aesthetic image. In other words, you, you, I mean, will you accept that you're a <laughs> cultural producer in that sense? In other words, you're shaping, <laughs> you're, shaping an, you're shaping an image like any other artist would with the purpose, like with any other artist, of, of changing perception, showing people their, their world maybe for the first time? Well, when it comes to the carbon tracker, I'm just the chairman and not even the founder, so <laughs> I, I wouldn't assume any um, authorship. Uh, it, it's just a very small, elite, and fabulously talented team, but um, I think design and the imagery of it is terribly important, yeah. and we have a brilliant young analyst there called James Leeton, who also is very good at design, and if you look at the reports, that they've been really um, complimented for the way that the, the information is portrayed visually, and it is very important the it use is, of the yeah. use of bubbles and all the rest of it, so that people can visualise what we're talking about. And um, apropos Kate's point, um, with the carbon disclosure project. I have to be careful because you know some of my very good mates run that organization. It's a great but organization. <laughs> I've said it. I've said it publicly. I'll say it, say it again. You know, the here again. There's a very powerful image um, of the distinction between the carbon disclosure project and carbon tracker. Right. And it involves the Hoover Dam here in the States, and you see the little trickle of water bursting, you know, out of the out of the dam. That's what is emitted every year. And in a way, that's not the key thing. What's important is this massive body yeah. of water behind the dam. And what's emitted every year, no wonder Exxon don't worry too much about that. It's sort of relatively tiny. Right. Um, but what's behind the dam, the more disclosure we have right. about that, the more ventilation, the more discussion of risk of, uh, you know, for those who invest in it, wasting their money, literally wasting their investment money, uh, that can really help with all sorts of things. Right. 